and welcome back to Planet and the People, episode 7 of series 2, but part 2 of this little two episode special, if you like. I am still in Battersea Park, trying to record in time with the planes not going over overhead. Last episode was all about the aviation industry, so if you're tuning in now for the first time but you'd like to hear a little bit about air travel and the impacts of air travel and what the aviation industry are doing, then do feel free to go back and have a listen to this one. But this episode is all about a slightly lesser known substance, climate resource, climate solution if you like, called biochar. Now if you haven't heard of biochar then that's probably quite normal. I hadn't heard of it before I was approached by Carbo Culture, the organisation in question for this episode. Now, there are so many different climate solutions out there. That is something I have learnt from doing this podcast. All of these different organisations that are exploring different technologies or different ways to innovate and different ways to basically fight climate change. And Carbo Culture is one of those companies. Carbo Culture deal in biochar. So without rambling on, I will pass you over to my conversation back online uh, late last year with Henrietta Moon from Carbo Culture. Thank you very much, Henrietta, for talking to me. Uh, you're actually one of the few, the first organisations that have actually contacted me rather than me contacting them. So thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, yeah, great to be with you. And uh, you, uh, you are here representing Carbo Culture and you are pioneers, is that the right description? You're pioneers, I suppose, of a, of a potential climate change solution that I have never heard of. Really? Okay. And a lot of people have never heard of. I've mentioned that I'm going to be talking about uh, biochar and people say, what's that? <laughs> so <laughs> I suppose my first question, uh, what is biochar? Yeah, well, first of all, thanks uh, thanks for having us and uh, super cool that there's a Planet podcast. Uh, that's always beneficial. Um, so so biochar is, is kind of like, it's a form of carbon. Um, biochar is made from woody biomass and it's kind of like a charcoal but it's destined for environmental purposes Um, so essentially you can think of it as a way to draw down carbon and and the way that it draws down carbon is that if you would leave your wood chips or nutshells out in the garden for for a few years they would actually decompose and return to the atmosphere so essentially, like 99% of it returns to the atmosphere. Maybe 1% gets, gets sequestered in soil. But if you turn that biomass, so wood chips or nutshells or something like this, into a charcoal or biochar, as we call it, um, essentially, it'll turn into a more stable form. So not return to the atmosphere for, for let's say, 500 years or, or even more than that. And so essentially you're taking away from the natural carbon cycle and kind of locking it down for a little while. And because of the the carbon form, it's not something that microbes will eat or anything like that. So that's why it doesn't doesn't get decomposed in, in that time frame. So it's essentially a charcoal. Yeah. Kind of like there's this huge natural global carbon cycle that happens every year as biomass, you know, draws down carbon from the atmosphere and then re-releases it. But instead of trying to do the hard work of actually getting parts per million out of the atmosphere as carbon atoms, we can let nature do the work and and put it into trees or or any kind of woody waste. Obviously, we're not chopping down forests for this. No. Uh, and then we <laughs> can good. turn it into this carbon. So how do you make it? So what is it made from? So you say biomass. So it's made from biomass that will generally release it and burning it and creating it into biochar will stop it releasing the the carbon. Is that that's correct? Yeah. So essentially, you have to have to kind of like uh, it's it's a little bit more complex than a burning process because you're trying to avoid 
releasing the carbon. So you have to essentially bring the biomass to a really high temperature and, and then not let it burn when it gets there. So then it chars, but it doesn't uh, actually combust. And, and that's essentially the kind of like technology used for it. So, so biochar is like a thousands year old technique. I mean, like humans have been making charcoal forever, so it's nothing new for us. Uh, but biochar was originally used in the uh, by Amazon tribes to, for soil fertility. So they actually buried their compost with this kind of carbon and saw great increases in their in their soil productivity. But uh, today, instead of kits, uh, it's it's made in kind of like kilns. And some of these systems are more like uh, oven type systems. There's all sorts of possible versions of this out there. And, and ours is kind of like a ultra efficient burn through the biomass. So does biochar then sequester carbon dioxide from the atmosphere once it's been made? Or is it the sequestered carbon dioxide in the biomass that then you lock away? It's exactly far more the idea is the second one. It's the carbon in the biomass that you're not letting release. Oh, okay. Uh, there are benefits from using biochar further down the line. So mixing it in compost or putting it in the soil with nutrients uh, can actually help the soil. It's not like a magical yield increase or anything like that, but it'll help the soil condition so that it's far less prone for eroding or, or for other degradation. Yeah. I was going to ask you that because soil degradation is a massive problem and yeah. soil itself has a huge potential to sequester carbon dioxide. And so is this a potential solution for helping soil degradation and to try and prevent it and cure it? Yeah, I mean, I think we're we're part of a toolkit. I hate to kind of like uh, say that there's a silver bullet that we can use and everything will be fine. <laughs> but it's it's actually part of a toolkit. And I think another part of that toolkit that needs to be remembered with this biochar is the nutrients. So how do you actually get those beneficial, micro, you know, the microbiome of the soil? How do you essentially keep it there? and the stuff that keeps the soil actually alive. And the carbon kind of helps it. So alone, I don't think, you know, the carbon can sit there and, and stuff, but it really needs that community of, of microbes to, to succeed in the soil. Is this something that can be sold as a fertilizer then? Uh, as an ingredient of it, yes. Okay. There's other aspects more than, than just the carbon sequestration that if you can prevent nutrient leaching or uh, airborne greenhouse gases uh, from releasing and other kinds of things, that's great. But also uh, biocarbon is used or biochar is used in urban spaces for stormwater filtration and other kinds of applications that that relate to soil very heavily, but also the function of the carbon can be used as a replacement for more harmful materials or or just as a kind of carbon filter, for example. So, so I think it has a lot of potential. Uh, the applications are kind of all over the place still. Uh, so, so there's a lot of work there, but it's, it's kind of fun to be uh, helping form those things. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to ask you a little bit more about sort of what it can be used for and all the various different things. But first of all, back to the sort of the basics, the, the um, I'm not going to say burning, but the creation of biochar from biomass. So what is the biomass that you're talking about? What are you making uh, yeah, the biochar yeah. from? Yeah, so, so uh, we're converting walnut shells uh, at the moment, peach pits, wood chips. We've tried olive pits as well. So things that you don't think are even wood, uh, but are actually leftovers from the food industry. So those are big, especially in California, where, where the food industry is so concentrated. And uh, in Europe, it'll probably be waste wood. So both uh, construction waste and also forestry waste. Okay, that, so, is it, so it is something that you can use to harness waste products. Yes and no. Uh, so we don't consider ourselves a waste company because usually waste companies uh, kind of meaning is to get rid of the stuff. And for us, what we try to do is we have that initial amount of carbon in the biomass and we try to retain as much of that carbon as possible. So if we're processing a lot of air or water, then we're just 
inefficient. So, so yes, we can process all sorts of stuff. And oftentimes we sometimes get emails that are really funny, like, hey, I have like 20,000 20, tons of, well, not so much, but uh, some tons of rose petals. Can you come and process these or, or something <laughs> really bizarre? And <laughs> it's kind of like, yeah, it would be fun, but uh, <laughs> but. We're, we're trying to kind of make a replicatable. Yeah. <laughs> Is it something ag- agricultural waste, ag- uh, agricultural waste in general? Is that something that, so you wouldn't, you wouldn't process rubbish? No, 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 no. That uh, household waste is totally different game. That's the word household waste. Yeah. <laughs> but you might, you might do agricultural waste. Is that something? Yeah. Yeah. So what's um what happens to the what happens with this biomass if you don't do this? So if you weren't here making biochar, how much carbon dioxide would it release? Yeah, I mean it really depends on the area that you are in. I guess for woody stuff you could almost use a ton to ton ratio. So a ton of biomass should release about one ton of CO2. But it might be first released as methane, which is far more powerful than CO2. So it's a little bit complicated, but let's say one one to one or something like this. And uh, what happens to the waste if we're not there? So that depends on the location. Uh, California has a lot of problems with their biomass. And so they have had waste biopower uh, facilities or they're making using it uh, to burn it for energy. Oh, okay. But it's actually more expensive energy than than solar. So they're okay. kind of artificially kept going just because they, they have so much excess biomass that they need to get rid of it. There's also open burning of the biomass, which is never great. It's absolutely horrific for the local air quality. It's among the worst in the US, which says a lot. Uh, <laughs> but then... Um, but then there are kind of like more creative ways of using the biomass as well, which are coming up. And uh, in Europe, I mean, I'm from Finland. We like there is no stick that goes unused in this country. Like we have like 150 processes down the line. <laughs> there is such an old industry of paper and pulp and and new, now there's new biomaterials. People are making clothing from wood fibers. It's really, really cool what's happening. Uh, you know, packaging instead of plastic and, and all sorts of stuff. So it really depends on the region where you are, what's the kind of like um, setup that they have and what types of waste they have there as well. So in Europe right now, I'd say the type of waste that we would be using is typically kind of like the, the end uh of the line and that's usually taken to coal power plants that want to transition to to burning biomass so they will be take essentially they will be taken away that that woody mass that biomass will be taken away and burnt and released carbon dioxide if you are not making it into biochar yeah or if it's not being made into biochar yeah okay and you mentioned earlier that it um it helps prevent other greenhouse gases such as methane be released yeah, so this so, so this is kind of like a uh, still work in progress. Um, we're we're going to be researching in the next years with with some universities what happens when you combine the biochar with a composting process or a manure or something else. So so obviously there's a process that's happening with all the microbial life and stuff like that, especially if you have a good composting process. So the biochar can actually help that process and give surface area and aeration and everything to that process itself. And then the good news is that the biochar is already full of those good micro, like, uh, microbiome when it goes into the soil. But now it's less understood uh, how does it impact the greenhouse gas total. So like if, if we put 5% of biochar in, how does it affect the methane or the noxes or something else? Or if we put 10% in, and these are tests that we first do in the lab with, with a controlled setup. And then we try to expand that until we get to field size and see if we can test over there. And I guess the problem with these testing type things are that A, the lab testing is very far removed from real life because you never have a completely controlled weather slash rain slash everything uh process and then and then secondly the 
the field testing is very difficult and time consuming and stuff like that. But we're we're trying to figure it out. And there's there's a bunch of good research being done uh, all around the world around uh, biocarbon or biochar being able to kind of reduce some of the other greenhouse gases in these processes. But this is like one aspect of it. So the other way that we can limit greenhouse gases, which is kind of like more what we're working on exactly today as we keep on doing these researches, is the urban area. Uh, So there's both, you know, materials in construction that we can uh, bring biochar into. So we have a few companies testing with our material who are making either polymers or, or concrete, for example, and the biochar can be uh, a very strong but lightweight addition to these materials and lessen their carbon footprint in this way. And another very easy way is also to use the carbon for the green infrastructure in the city. So all the trees and what we call our like constructed uh biofilters so there's all this rainwater that hits the city it'll get contaminated in the city with heavy metals and microplastics and all sorts of stuff so ideally you want to filter that before it enters the rivers and the and the seas or the oceans uh, or before it gets absorbed into into the soil and into the water systems so what cities have started doing are building these kind of biofilter areas but you could use biochar sand and other biofilter mediums and then some greenery to kind of direct the water to before it's directed into the nature. So biochar essentially can be used as a great big filter. All the water can run through it and all the crap gets held in it essentially and then it's clean <laughs> afterwards. Is it that simple? Yeah, kind of <laughs> like that. <laughs> but it's different. So if you're trying to purify water, the water has to go through the filter. So chucking a piece of this in your water glass is not going to magically uh, <laughs> decontaminate it. Oh. <laughs> don't do this I at do, home. I don't, I don't mean yeah. that for drinking water. Um, Will it taste nice? <laughs> I mean it more in rivers and, and oceans. It, it can be used to sort of decontaminate uh, well, contaminated water. Yeah, exactly. And... It can be used as a building material. Yeah. So you can use it as a concrete and it, as a substitute for concrete or as an addition? No, as an addition in these uh, materials. So there are some materials that are like sort of plastics, like polymers that they're trying to add either wood fibers or, or biochar into. And that really reduces the product's um, carbon footprint and sometimes also the price. Um, and it's a very sturdy material. The carbon is very, very strong. So, so that's why people like it. So a question, uh, one of the things you say on your website is that globally, we need to draw down a trillion tons of CO2 in the next decade. Is that a figure that has been given by what the IPCC, is that an actual figure? Uh, yeah, three decades, actually, but yes. <laughs> oh, that's three decades. Okay, <laughs> so that. a third but, of a trillion. <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, essentially by 2050, we should get to net zero, uh, so-called net mm. zero, which means that for, like that's one thing. And then the second thing is the buildup of the carbon, the trillion tons that we need to get down. So essentially, like we put too much of this carbon stuff in the atmosphere, it heats up faster than air, it's going to be a greenhouse in here that makes our climate go haywire. Okay, so we need to bring the carbon down, one thing, and then we need to stop putting so much carbon in there. Uh, second thing. So <laughs> You make it sound so straightforward. So easy. Uh, <laughs> yeah, everybody go and capture some parts per million out there. Um, so essentially, the trillion tons is a known figure that, that essentially could help us limit uh, global warming under 1.5 Celsius. And the net zero is something that um, the IPCC, I think, put in their uh, 1.5 2018 report, um, maybe there's some newer figures on this as well, but basically net zero means that if we're still emitting something, we need to do carbon removal to equal or make that zero. And and that's kind of like, uh, yeah, we're very far from those targets still. <laughs> but if we do if we do like good reduction every year, they're totally attainable still. So I don't want to be like a doomsdayer. Uh, definitely not. Uh, I think nothing like the last minute to fix things. Uh, <laughs> but um, but it's also, also often people don't feel a very strong urge about 1.5 Celsius. 
but it 1.5 Celsius can mean eight Celsius somewhere elsewhere. It can mean crop failure. It can mean ocean current stuff. It can mean total rain changes. It's it's so much more than just you know oh I'm out in Brighton on a beach like what is one degree more? It's not that. It's it's the systems that we live in. Uh, we're not sure what they'll do. We really don't want to get as far as that. Uh... <laughs> So where does biochar fit in that? Because bi- so biochar is a, um, would you describe it as a preventative of emissions or a drawing down of existing carbon? Yeah, so so it's called a, it's kind of like a hybrid of natural solutions and technological solutions. So, so I would call it a net, so a negative emission technology. Um, and the, the carbon credits that we're selling are carbon removal credits. So we're going to start selling them on a platform called puro.earth, P-U-R-O.earth. Um, and they're one of the first kind of platforms to do carbon removal. Uh, they do wood-based carbon removal. So also uh, woody woody constructions and, and stuff like this. And uh, yeah. Okay. So, it is, so okay, right. So it's cause, because the thing I'm confused about is it is it, it's a removal. It is a removal system because the the woody substance would be releasing it you you are removing existing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere exactly the trees are removing it and we're just converting it into a stable form okay right okay sorry i'm so bad at explaining this <laughs> no 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 i'm just trying to get to the bottom of it so the so when we turn it into this carbon form our particular carbon we have lab tested um And there's peer review literature on like how long it'll stay stable. And ours is somewhere with a half life of over 1000 years. So half of it should still be around in 1000 years. So it's a very, very long term offset. Uh, Some of the above boundaries for us are something like hundreds of thousands of years. So it's, it's pretty crazy to think about such a long time span. So uh, this is something that, that people buy as a carbon offsetting system as well yeah so we're uh we're soon gonna start selling them um i can kind of like mention here that uh we're selling them uh through puro which is the kind of crediting agency and and the verification system and uh south pole is one of our first partners and and we're working with them and they're helping us kind of uh sell this carbon removal and and help understand people understand what it really means how prevalent is biochar in terms of uh, climate relevance? How climate relevant are you at the moment? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's a paper in Nature that I actually liked, and I, I think scientific papers are terribly complicated for me, but uh, in any case, this one was uh, legible. <laughs> so so there's one by Hepburn and all in Nature from last November 2019, and there's it's called something like the techno-economic pathways of CO2 utilization. And they list about 10 different ways of actually taking down carbon or removing it or reusing uh, CO2. And, and biochar is definitely one of, the, one of the methods that are medium to low in price, uh, very high impact potential, up to two gigatons a year, and also uh, feasible. So, so a lot of these things are kind of like very far in the future, but are like to put it in perspective, NASA uses this kind of a technology readiness scale. And it kind of says like, are you operating something that's the size of a microwave or are you operating something that's the size of a shipping container <laughs> or something that's actually like full scale? And, and it means like, are you ready to kind of go out into the world? And we're pretty close to, we're already operating in a, demonstrable real world setting and now all we need to do is go inch it a few steps forward and then it'll be commercial so so really kind of like the feasibility is there we're pretty far in progress it's not a terribly expensive technology you know all the things are there to actually make impact so the uh when you say you're quite close to being commercial going through the commercial potentials you've got building materials you've got a decontamination of water 
what else was there? Yeah, stormwater filtration, we call it. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, stormwater filtration, yeah. that's the correct um, but... term. But De- decontamination of water, okay. <laughs> yeah, something like that. Uh, and construction materials and, and then this green infrastructure uh, in cities. So green roofs and uh, city trees and all this kind of stuff. And it's often linked to the stormwater aspect as well. Sorry, green roofs. Do you mean literally milk making roof tiles or having roof gardens yeah more like roof gardens and greening greening the places that we previously had as just pavement so so basically cities are looking at innovative ways of uh, directing the rainwater and also having more greenery in the city and and biochar is a great part of that uh, kind of growing industry and so we're kind of focused on these urban areas for now and, and that's a big enough chunk for us to chew at the moment. And we're also researching kind of like the future applications in, in farming and agriculture. This is biochar being used as a an effective fertilizer in a way. Is that what is that how you use biochar to greenify cities? Is greenify is that a uh, word? But mm, yeah, so so like well, I guess the one of the most successful projects is Stockholm. So they saw that a lot of their trees were uh, about a third of their trees were dying off. And they started thinking of ways of planting them better or what could they do better so that they would live because understandably it's very costly to go and and dig these trees out after you have the asphalt and the piping and everything designed around it. So so they started using structured soils and biochar and and essentially like that made sure that the trees didn't asphyxiate they w- didn't run out of oxygen which is a very common reason for urban areas they kind of suffocated the trees basically so so with this biochar and the structured soils they could bring bring in um, water holding capacity some air you know keep the nutrients there and so the trees uh, are doing really really well and the program is so successful that I think I think almost all of their new trees are are planted in this way. Um, so so this is kind of like an example to all the other areas in greening. And on the rooftops, the carbon is a very lightweight material that can help hold some of that water um, and the nutrients in that that bio bio kind of uh, layer. So so there's a lot of use useful cases for it. And the stormwater is obviously water treatment is is super interesting. That's kind of like where people know carbon, activated carbon is used in water treatment. Why couldn't it be the cleaner and cheaper alternative called biochar? Mm. So where would you say Carbo Culture, the company that you're representing, is in terms of as a as an enterprise? Where are you with a supplier of commercial biochar? Yeah, so uh, we're still in demo phase. We're a pesky little... uh, startup uh but very determined (laughs) and uh so in 2022 we should have a commercial system up and running so if you need hundreds of tons of biochar you need to call me now uh they're selling out fast (laughs) (laughs) uh so so we have customers all over europe who are going to start testing with these larger amounts of biochar that we can make so, so we're growing capacity in the next years and growing team and all that jazz uh, <laughs> to, to get to a scale where we can actually start, start uh, calling ourselves a commercial operation. And you're, you're, you're Finland based or San Francisco based? Yeah, so, so uh, I'm Finnish. Uh, we're kind of Finnish Californian startup. My co-founder is out in California and uh, our demo system is out in Central Valley. So we're... I think half of the U.S. food is produced, at least the fruits and veg. Okay. So uh, as, a, as a question to wrap things up, I suppose, I ask everyone this, but how are you feeling about climate change in general at the moment? And are you feeling positive? Are you feeling doomsday? You sort of answered this question earlier, but especially in relation to COVID-19, do you think that COVID-19 is going to impact climate change in a positive or a potentially negative way? Hmm. Yeah, kind of this temperature reading. Uh, I'll tackle the first one first. So uh, climate change, how do I feel? I definitely feel a heavy sense of urgency, you know, like anybody 
who watches a few planet Earths, you know, with anxiety. <laughs> uh, but um, yeah, I think we have a lot of work to do. I mean, the, the amount of work, I can't communicate how much we need to do to change the course of what where we are going. It's uh, the, just a sheer amount of carbon that we need to bring down or all the other things that we're doing in terms of biodiversity, et cetera, is a very, very huge amount of work, but it's also a huge potential. It's uh, so much potential for all those, you know, startups and new companies and old companies innovating themselves and, and all this new economy that has never existed is right around the corner, which is super exciting. It's all going to happen in the next two, three decades. So, so everybody who is kind of like, early stage in it, I think is in a good, good position. So, so if you're listening and you're thinking of getting into it, uh, please join, <laughs> uh, about COVID-19, I have no idea. Uh, I'm not a epidemiologist, but, or a social scientist, but, um, I guess there's been some, some, some sort of a pause, at least for some people to, to think about things, but I, I don't know the psychological kind of deeper, Deeper things, but it seems that business travel is uh, going down, which yeah, is great. Yeah, for now. <laughs> um, but yeah, hopefully it'll, it'll help us kind of rethink and shift a little bit faster into what's necessary. And I can say that from my own business environment, how many climate VCs, how many angel investors in climate have popped up. There's a lot of people, they're super new to the subject, but in the last half a year there's been more than in the past five years so there is a change happening and i am optimistic that things will will change i suppose uh, i'm talking to you now and you're de you're dealing with biochar which is a way of removing carbon dioxide i've spoken to climeworks about carbon dioxide air, direct yeah. air capture removal there is soil healthy soil has the potential there's tree planting there's yeah. renewable energy there's so much available to us and then it's just about yeah. making it happen. And so with that in mind, what would you like, from your side of the sense that you're doing biochar, what would you like world governments, your government, what would you like from the governments in order to make your piece of the solution big? Yeah, good question. I mean, I think definitely uh, considering a climate tax would be great. Uh, that's kind of like a sort of easy fix. Uh, also, a carbon tax. Yeah, I think a carbon tax would be useful because it would. You need to drive, maybe not just for us useful. I think in in the broader kind of problem uh, fitting, it would be useful because you want to drive towards positive behavior and away from the negative, and a carbon tax could be a great mechanism to kind of do that naturally so the ones who are polluting need to innovate or need to buy carbon offsets so that they can kind of keep up in the game but it needs to be universal because otherwise we'll just be displacing the the dirty economy somewhere elsewhere where they don't have these things yet so so we need to kind of be mindful of that um definitely i think there's tools out there i think yeah there's a lot of work. <laughs> That's a really interesting answer, carbon tax. I think, I mean, there's so many things that they could do. There's also, you know, like giving the power to to the people who are like, let's say in a city government or something like this, just trusting people more with their own kind of judgment and making the processes a bit faster uh, would be necessary. I think governments could procure a lot more from smaller players. They're of always so intimidated at touching anything that doesn't have a revenue of a billion at least. Uh, so it's so a really kind of like favoring the innovation space would, would also be good. Yeah. Well, Henrietta, thank you very much for giving up your time to talk to me today. I don't know if you have anything else to add that you'd like to add about carboculture, about biochar, but I feel like I understand it a, a lot more now. Uh, I did do it. I did do a little bit of research before talking to you, yeah. so I wasn't completely unknowledgeable. But I, <laughs> I hopefully people listening will now know all about it. Yeah, maybe like the kind of like final remark would be that that nature already knows a lot of these processes, and she already has the toolkit that we need to do these things. Now we can just use technology to kind of 
make it a bit faster or or perhaps uh, help in that process. And that's essentially what biochar is. So every ton of material that we make contains over three tons of CO2. So it's a very, very efficient way of keeping it down. And, and this is what we need more of. Why not finish my outros for this week with a plane going overhead? Uh, that was Henrietta Moon from Carbo Culture. So if you didn't know about biochar before, then hopefully you do now. I've included Carbo Culture's website in the show notes so you can find out all about them and about the work they're doing. So I won't be back next week for another episode as... I am going to be making a film, which is something else I do. But I will be back the following week uh, with an episode all about cleaning the oceans of plastic. So, once again, if you have enjoyed this episode and would like to hear more, there is a backlog of other episodes. I mentioned at the beginning of this a few of the organisations I've spoken to. Ecosia, which is a search engine like Google, but they use their ad revenue to plant trees around the world. I had a fantastic conversation um, in episode five of series one, all about that. I've got uh, Climeworks, an Arctic ice project in episode three of series one. Climeworks is a direct air capture company using technology to suck carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. Arctic ice project, formerly known as Ice 911 Research is an organisation that is finding out ways of, of slowing down the ice albedo effect in the Arctic. If you, Don't ask me what that is. Listen to the episode. It's basically protecting the Arctic and trying to make the Arctic ice more reflective and to slow down climate change that way. Uh, who else have I got? Uh, I've got the Sustainable Food Trust finding out how to make farming a climate solution rather than a climate problem. This is all series one. Find out about hemp in series one as well i think that was episode six find about about the economy just listing off everything really and then in this series i have got uh, the origins and pandemics that is something that i would very very strongly recommend i've had quite a few comments about that episode since then about how people don't really really think about why we have been having the year we have been having it's all about how to get out of it but less about how to try and make sure it doesn't happen again. That is episode three of this series, series two, The Origins of Pandemics. I could go on, listen to them all. Anyway, I will be back in two weeks. My name is Tom Ward-Thomas. This is Planet and the People. Please do subscribe if you never want to miss an episode. Feel free to tell your friends and family all about the podcast. Uh, I am on social media, at Planet and the People, on Instagram and Facebook, and at Planet and the P on Twitter. Uh, until two weeks' time, goodbye!